Uh, good evening and uh, good afternoon to all those people who have been here joining in this uh, seventh uh, webinar conducted by the Journal of Hand Metal Surgery. Uh, and uh, we have uh, all the eminent uh, uh, moderators and great teachers who have been uh, very diligently working on how to train the hand surgeons and how to promote or impart the uh, younger generations to come in. We all know that you know, gaining knowledge is the first step of wisdom, and then sharing to the next generation is the best step for, for good humanity. So with this brief introduction, uh, we welcome Dr. Vaikunth from Singapore, Dr. Felipe from France, and the moderator of the evening, Professor Dr. Sridhar from India. The program is, the speakers will be uh, delivering the talk about 20 minutes approximately, followed by a discussion at the end. The attendees can ask or can raise questions in the chat box, which we will discuss at the end. Uh, to start with, we have uh, Dr. Philippe Levanas from France. Uh, he has been you know, a, a great editor and has attained many positions, especially in the field of hand and microsurgery. He has been the chairman of the Starbuck University Hospital. His contribution is very immense. And I was just chatting with him about what can be the next general club topic. And immediately he said it will about the, the hand surgery training and the various modules to teach the younger generations. Thanks, Dr. Philippe, for uh, this uh, wonderful title. And uh, followed subsequently, uh, we had uh, Dr. Y and uh, Dr. Uh, Lee, uh, who swiftly said, yes, we will go ahead. And Dr. Y was very interesting. He said it was my thesis topic. So he can talk for an hour a day more than uh, in this uh, webinar time. So with this a brief uh, introduction about that, we will start this uh, evening program with uh, first talk by Dr. Philippe Levanas. I will turn the invitation. So I guess you can see my, my screen right now. Yes? Yep. Okay. So my name is uh, Philippe uh, Liverno. I am chair of orthopedic and plastic surgery in Strasbourg University Hospital. And I've got some uh, conflict of interest with a uh, nuclear technique in France, uh, uh, Argo Medical in Switzerland, and uh, Kersan Tax in uh, Germany. So Strasbourg, for those who don't know, is exactly in the middle of, uh, of Europe. And we have a uh, European Parliament in Strasbourg. So the, the aim of this uh, topic uh, today is to um, uh, introduce the concept of uh, a new method of learning surgery I call the deliberate practice. And the goal of it is to improve performance of uh, surgeons in general and hand surgeons in particular, and also to avoid adverse events. So everybody knows that learning surgeries uh, has usually two steps. The first one is mentoring. I mean, when you are a resident, a fellow in a university hospital or in a private clinic, so there is a senior surgeon, you are a, a junior surgeon, you're looking to what the senior surgeon is doing, watching and introducing your, in, your, in your mind some uh, uh, trips that the senior surgeon will show you. Then you will take the blade and the control of the senior surgeon and the senior surgeon will tell you, yes, it's good or stop, you are doing a mistake. And step by step, you will learn like this. Then the second step is getting experience, what we call mere experience. And of course, 
this uh, second step is difficult to accept in the uh, nowadays because of the concept of uh, never the first time on the patient. So, of course, you can learn on the simulator, but it's not enough. Uh, a simulator, even in a, 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 in a made of silicone or plastic or whatever, is not enough to get a good experience to perform, to become a, a, a good surgeon. I mean, a, 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 you get a good level. I mean, there are five levels of of performance of surgeon defined by Tongue and Giddings. One is very bad, a beginner, and five is a, is an expert. And here we would like to introduce a, a, a new method of of teaching uh, uh, surgery. We call that deal with practice. This is a concept, you know, which of course is very old, but uh, is a guy uh, Ericsson, a professor of psychology, who uh, just passed away last year because of the COVID nineteen. And he, this this uh, professor was in Florida, and he worked all his life on this concept of deliberate practice. So what it is? First of all, you need a you need a goal. It's designed to improve performance. I can't hear you. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you make the screen full screen? Uh, you mean uh, yes? It, it, it is. Do okay. You, see, you don't there see is, the full screen? Yeah, there is an option at the at the top right side of the presentation. Can it be made a full screen so that we won't see the next slide? Ah, okay, I see. I see. Okay, so stop sharing and I will do it again. Maybe it's the maybe it is uh this one, I guess. I think it's not a good one right now. Could, could, can you see? Can you see it in the full screen? Okay, it is better. Uh, we are seeing the next slide too. There's ah. an option called in the top right. An option. Okay. Maybe or maybe. Ah. Okay, maybe that one. Is it correct right now? No. No. Okay. Stop sharing again. And share this. That one. Yeah, much okay. better. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Okay, very good. Thanks. So the the concept of deliberate practice is first of all to um, to define a goal. It's designed to improve performance. So first of all, you have to be to, to define a goal. And uh, then um, you are doing your your activity, and then you get you need to get the feedback, and this feedback should be available continuously and when you get this feedback you have to ask to a coach an expert or a senior surgeon or whatever which uh, watch your uh, videos and uh, criticize your videos and uh, uh, gives you some advice to improve your skills and then you have to repeat uh, a lot the gestures that the coach um, just teach to you, and it's very, very demanding. Uh, it's not fun, it's not a game. It's something that you have to repeat and to take conscience of what you are doing here. So, um, there is an example here of the concept of deliberate practice. And Ericsson says that you need about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice to become an expert. An expert of what? Of whatever you want. In sports, in chess, in music, even in surgery. So some uh, papers were published uh, here a long time ago about the 
uh, uh, young violinist. And the violinist, when they start at four year old, they become an expert at about 18 years old. Because these guys, you know, they perform about 10,000 hours of deliberate practice from the year four to the year 18. David practice means that when a violinist, a young violinist is uh, training, there is always an expert, his teacher, close to him, and he's telling to him, oh, this is, a, this is not good sound, and you should do this, or you should do that. Please, try again, and again, and again, until it's correct. This is what is David practice. Now, if you look in, uh, in surgery, a resident in surgery in Europe, because the law um, says that you can't perform as a resident more than 40 hours a week of performing uh, surgery. You can say that there is about 48 weeks a year you can, of course, uh, work. And the residency is lasting about five years so it's an amount of 11,000 hours of practice in the us it's a little bit more it's a little bit less than 20,000 hours so you can say okay i'm resident i've done five years of practice in surgery 10,000 hours of practice i am an expert and nobody knows that a resident after five years of surgery, is not an expert at all. Why? First of all, he starts surgery at his residency at 25 years old, as a novice. But a violinist starts at four or six, you know, and the brain and your ability to learn is totally different at, this age, at that age. And also, a resident in surgery is not doing 10,000 hours of deliberate practice. He is doing most of the time naive practice. I mean, he's doing the surgery alone or uh, in, the, in the emergency department uh, some, uh, under the control of the, of, the, uh, of the senior surgeon. And uh, most of the time he's looking and uh, uh, holding the retractors. This is not deliberate practice. There is not a teacher every every hour telling him you have to do this and again and again and again. So in sports, it's very well known, like in, uh, in music, you know, the uh, uh, soccer player, uh, uh, they are always uh, training in deliberate practice. They are in some uh, rooms like that, that rooms you can see, and there are um, videos everywhere and some targets, and there are different movements they have to do. Uh, dribble, jump, and be precise in their shoots and so on. And there are scores which are automatically recorded. And this course, they can compare the scores to other uh, uh, players. And the coach can tell them, okay, look, you are not good in this part to gesture. You have to improve that and to do this. So my question is, why should we not be able to do the same in Surgery. I mean, in endoscopic surgery, uh, in uh, exoscopic surgery, like here, or in microsurgery. So why should we not be able to uh, to deliver some scores to uh, young surgeons like OSATs, like you can see here, and we define with a uh, with a special platform. We define some scores. For instance, here on, on the in the middle for distal radius plating. And we are able to monitor the amount of uh, OSAT that the young surgeons uh, was uh, is able to do. So we conducted two studies, and the first study was performed with the help of uh, Dr. Francois Ducono in our department. And this study was to improve surgeon performance, and we choose the minimally invasive approach for distal radius fractures and malunion as um, uh, fractures, only fractures, as uh, uh, an experiment. And we compare the three methods of 
teaching surgery, mentoring, marriage plan, and deliberate practice. And we define some OSATs here. I will not go uh, in details, but there are 10 basic skills, one, two, three, four, ten, ten 10 specific skills, and each skill got a mark from one, very bad, to five, perfect. Then we got a score from 10 to 100, and we defined some intervals, and with these intervals, we got the surgeon performance from one beginner to five experts. So we choose uh, 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 four young surgeons level uh, uh, five, a uh, level three, and uh, we ask them each to perform five distal radius fracture plating. We recorded all the videos, so we got 20 videos, and we watched all the videos and we identify uh, an OSAT scores and uh, uh, for all the uh, all the, um, the distal radius fractures and we got a score here and we measured uh, the, the quality, the performance of uh, each uh, surgery. These young surgeons were started uh, distal radius plating as their own for the first time and of course uh, before that they were resident and they performed some distal radius fractures before, like resident, but not like a fellow. Then, so when we got, we were here during mentoring, they got uh, 20 videos and we measured the OSAT. After that, we asked them to, to read a paper in which it's uh, precisely defined the different tricks of, uh, uh, and the, the, the objective of doing a perfect distal radius plating. And we send them a video, which was supposed to be the perfect video of distal radius plating. We call this their experience. I mean, they got a, a, a better idea what they wanted to do. And then we ask them, please, again, the four of them, please do five more uh, uh, distal radius uh, fractures. And we recorded the videos. So we got uh, uh, 40 videos. And of these 40 videos, we picked up um, 20 short sequences, and, and we gathered all these sequences here in this video running very fast. And on these videos, there were all the mistakes they did according to the OSATs, 20, 10 basic skills, 10 uh, specific skills. And we, uh, we gathered the young, all the surgeons in a room, and in two hours, we discuss, we explain, we tell them, okay, there is a problem. Now you have to focus on this mistake you've done, on this mistake, because this is your video, and now you have to improve this. And after that, we asked them again to perform 20, 20 distal radius fractures, and we recorded the OSATs. So we have the OSATs for mentoring, their experience, and deliberate practice. And guess what? This is here the result. With mentoring, they remain at the level three. Uh, 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 because according to the interval that we defined in, uh, previously, they are we were still in the in the level three. With mere experience, they improved a little bit their specific skills because the uh, the paper said that this is the target. On the paper and on the perfect video, they were not advised about the mistakes that they did, of course, because it's only the experience. So they improved a little bit, but they remain in the level three. And after deliberate practice, after they realized what were their mistakes, they improved a lot. And all of them, and you know that sometimes if you look at four young surgeons, one of them is bad, one of them is very good, and two of them are about the middle, all of them got the level five. They improved the basic skills and the specific skills. So in, in, in 16 standardized factors, so it's very, very fast. And uh, if you are a, 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 a regular surgeon, if you want to get that level, it will take a lot of time. So here in this first study, we wanted to say that, okay, uh, deal with practice can improve the surgeon performance. Uh, 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 this is the first thing that we wanted to, to uh, uh, demonstrate. And this paper is, uh, has been accepted and will be published uh, 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 very soon. The second study, we uh, are conducting this second study with uh, uh, another surgeon, Dr. Morgan Delbar in our department. And uh, in, uh, in this uh, study, we would like to decrease the 
X-ray exposure for the surgeon. And this is not finished, but we have already some uh, uh, results. So the hypothesis is, can we decrease the X-ray exposure? So the material, we've got two groups. One, a group one is naive practice, three surgeons level three, 30, uh, the first 30 uh, uh, distal radius fractures in minima invasive plateau stationaries each, same for the, the group two, but they uh, were uh, 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 watching debris practice uh, staff meeting. And uh, in naive practice, they, okay, they just, just do it. In debris practice, we ask them, okay, you need motivation. You will get some feedback on your errors done by, uh, uh, delivered by an expert on X-ray, on video, and we told them, don't put your hands below the X-ray, about to repeat unnecessary X-rays, position the X-ray as high as possible, use the laser before uh, during X-ray, use the half dose button, use the right technique, and repeat and repeat. And we got some uh, a mark like this, good, bad technique, bad, X-rays and below the X-ray. On that technique, we needed videos. So for each distal radius fracture, it needs a lot of distal radius fractures because 30 distal radius fractures for uh, um, uh, eight, uh, eight surg uh, uh, six surgeons, it's a lot of fractures. And we, uh, we um, uh, gave a mark, like you can see here. Oh, there is a hand here. Somewhere. This is the hand of the surgeon here, but the incidence is good. Uh, and this is a bad technique uh, 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 range, and this is a bad X ray and uh, unnecessary repeated X ray, etc. etc. So, uh, uh, um, and then uh, when we got the, the number, uh, the one which was orange, it's a bad technique, and I'm almost done, uh, 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 I know you, you want me to stop. Uh, 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 and uh, here we, uh, we watch the video uh, every week in what we call a staff meeting of deliberate practice, and uh, uh, we recorded the video so they can, the, the, the staff meeting, they can uh, uh, see the, the, the video later, and we discuss what were the mistakes. And this is the result. So this is the number of ends uh, below the X-ray on naive practice, on deliberate practice. Can you see the difference? It's obvious. And uh, young surgeons, they don't realize that it's important to remove the hands below the X-ray. The number of, of X-rays during, during the procedure, you can see on night practice, you know, the, the, the level is very high and also it doesn't, it doesn't change uh, uh, after uh, 30 um, uh, uh, X-rays. But here on, on night practice, on deliberate practice, it's decreasing some, some, sometimes very fast on, with some young surgeons, sometimes uh, 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 slower, but it's decreasing, and which is, this is very important. So if you give them a goal, if you repeat, if you give them some feedback, and uh, so they will realize that they have to change. And this is the, the amount of its waste uh, um, on night practice, on deliberate practice also, you can see there is a huge difference. Um, and also the duration of, of X-ray exposure, uh, you can see also here, there is a huge difference. So. If you want to take home a message, tell with practice can also decrease X-ray X exposure or whatever you, you target you have. So uh, this is the message I want to tell you. We need a new way of teaching surgery, which is more focused on the surgeon performance to, to avoid adverse events. And this is my new hospital, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Felipe. Uh, it was amazing. The concept of uh, mentoring, mere experience, and deliberate practice. And the results were really amazing. And it definitely will have an impact on the outcome, especially exposure to the radiation and the surgical video errors and surgical technical errors which you have shown in the video. Thank you very much. We have we'll be having a lot of questions in the end, and uh, thank you very much once again. Um, next is uh, Dr. Vaikun. Uh, Vaikun is the you know, one of uh, very close associate and a, 
a well wisher for journal of hand medical surgery in all aspects uh, he has been a constant strength in fact the journal uh, especially in all uh, endeavors new endeavors the moment we ask him to uh, talk on a topic and is uh, very much you know, enthusiastic and uh, interested in doing this uh, he has been a, a passion for uh, training the hand surgeons and he has developed an online platform how to train how to teach i've seen all his videos and the uh, life surgical techniques and all the models which he used for training the hand surgeons including microsurgery he has traveled to many countries uh, to 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 train uh, the younger generations and the uh, generations to come in the field of hand microsurgery uh, we are privileged to have dr vaikunth uh, we have a talk now uh, can i share a screen please yeah Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, you, you have a full screen? Yeah. Not yet. Yeah. yeah, thanks. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you, Terence, for inviting me. So today I'm going to talk about deliberate practice as one of the uh, models for surgical training, especially in hand surgery or for surgery in general. Uh, this is part of my PhD thesis work uh, that I have did over the last five years, and it is uh, was uh, funded by my institution with an educational grant and uh, uh, this is a PhD in education. And so I'll just share with you some of our conceptual work, plus also some of the uh, development, design and development of instructional materials that are based on sound educational principles. Um, my background is apart from hand surgery, I'm also a medical educator and an instructional designer. So I use all three domains to create this, this concept. So the, the five years of uh, research that I've done, uh, this is the summary. So uh, you look at this slide, you don't have to uh, spend time listening to me anymore. So the practice implication is, I think we need to relook at the way we are going to deliver surgical training. Uh, and mental skill training, the process of learning how to do deliberate practice plus mental practice will be the techniques that will be mandatory for young surgeons, just like basic surgical training. So they require this training. Faculty members need to have basic training in instructional design and technology so that they can be able to produce educationally sound instructional materials. So beyond just writing textbooks and procedures for uh, performing surgery, we need now to be able to be a, to create instructional materials that includes uh, enabling and facilitation for mental practice, which requires what is called a mental script. We'll come to a little bit uh, uh, in detail later. The, creating, the creation of an expert instructional video is mandatory. So we can't have enough people going around the world to teach. We therefore need to be able to bring the person asynchronously to all the students all over the world. The creation of a mental script is important. We'll later go in what a mental script is, which then needs to be incorporated into the instructional video. And then the design and development of high fidelity, low cost practice models so that deliberate practice can occur. So these require the, ex the expert panel, the, the subject matter experts to design it. So I think, uh, Professor Leveno has gone through the definition of deliberate practice, but just to reinforce it. So it is repeated practice of a motto task. So as surgeons, we are involved in the creation of a, a specific motto task in training. So it is structured in such a way to improve performance and you create various tasks and subtasks so that they can perform the action to the motto action to the point where they improve the performance to a level that is decided by the trainer and the trainee. And so that, that's, that's what deliberate practice is. So it is a, a, a highly structured moto activity from a deconstructed complex procedure to a level 
that is of, of, of a satisfactory performance to a level of expertise under the guidance and with feedback from the instructor. So uh, uh, I just uh, take it from there. So looking at the background, is there a problem? So traditionally, as Professor Livino uh, explained, it has been one of mentorship, the apprenticeship model. We followed the surgeon. This has now been lost with the residency training program. There's a reduction in the training hours of uh, uh, surgeons this time due to a host of reason from um, safety issues to the uh, a lack of um, training hours due to working time directives. And we are unable to train surgeons in the surgical room because of a host of reasons from efficiency to uh, 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 the lack of uh, opportunities for trainees to attend surgical training. There's been a political correctness of the non-surgical skills. Non-technical skills in surgeries are important. Don't get me wrong, it is not that it is not important, but a surgeon who does not know to operate is of no use if he's only good in counseling. So we need to go beyond that. So the, there's been studies, especially from Daniels and Giovanni, where it shows that most trained surgeons do not feel competent at the end of their training. And competency is not equivalent to mastery or expertise. So we have all kind of negotiated and bargained down our surgical training to provide safe and competent surgeons, but not necessarily masters. And we just left them in the community. So there's been a focus of that, and that needs to change. So, so the challenges to surgical training is, I think Dr. Levin has gone through that, Approximately based on a 40 hour work week, you need 12 and a half hours, uh, 12 and a half years uh, to bring about a competent surgeon. I'm not talking about a master surgeon, but a competent surgeon. And that's that's how the length of time it is. But are we happy with just competent surgeon or do we need master surgeons? So if we need master surgeons or experts, then the, the reference, the criterion's reference for assessment has to change from a normative to a criterion reference assessment. So that's another different thing. So the, the, the problem is how can we create expert surgeons effectively and efficiently? And that was my research uh, problem. And over the years, I, I looked through the various theoretical background uh, for motor skill acquisition. So these are the four theories that I looked at and I conceptualized a new model for surgical training. So the Fitz and Posner's theory is a very well-known theory of motor skill acquisition. So the cognitive thing is we learn a motor skill, okay, I need to take a needle holder, pick up a needle and suture uh, a tissue. Then once we, are, we have seen it, we try it, then we try and learn the steps in our head. So this is a cognitive process through called neural encoding, where the synapses are created, new pathways are created. Then we keep doing it to practice. We reach a state of autonomy that is expertise where we can perform it without even thinking. So this is the surgeon when he is a novice, you cannot disturb him, he won't talk, he just operates very high cognitive load to perform a motor task. But the expert performs it with great ease and he can con have a conversation with the anesthetist, he can uh, talk with the nurses and yet still be able to operate. The other theory that is there is the theory of social learning by Bandura. And this is called observation learning. And this is what we do. We observe the master surgeon operating. And that was what is now being lost because the apprenticeship model has been removed in surgical training. By watching the master surgeon, we, 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 have, an, we have become very attentive. We watch him, how he operates. Then we retain it. And then we try to reproduce it. And we need the motivation to do that. Then the deliberate practice of Ericsson is well uh, recognized and Ericsson got this from musicians, from piano players in the continent. And here you need to regularly keep doing that particular motto task repeatedly with specific activity and feedback so that that supports the learning. So what happens in the brain is called a Hebian modeling, where if you have a synapses that are constantly firing at the same time to produce a particular motor action, their new dendrites are formed to the extent in which you just have to say suture and immediately the whole host of motor action becomes one single action. 
and that's called Command Motor Center. And this has been shown by Rizolati's work and uh, Vilayana Ramachandran, who's a famous neurologist who, who invented the mirror therapy. Then we come to the fourth theory with the Generod's motor simulation theory. Now, simulation technology has brought us a lot of new things, but they are not easily accessible. They're expensive. Not everybody has this. So the, man, the motor simulation theory works on the concept that thinking about doing something is all good as doing it itself. So the covert action of a particular task is as good as an overt action if you have prior experience of that motor task. So this is the basis, the four theoretical models that I use to create a new model. So we did a, a, a literature review and uh, basically we summarized and uh, we, we submitted this for the annals and it's awaiting publication. Uh, is that out of 19 papers uh, on, on uh, mental practice, so the John Rod's mental motor simulation to mental practice is effective in skill acquisition and retention. Uh, however, what we found there was lack of methodological rigor in the various papers that were published. And they all talked about the importance of a mental script for mental practice. A mental script is the detailed uh, explanation of how to perform a particular motor task inclusive of kinesthetic cues. Hold the needle, feel the tension in your first web space as you hold a micro needle holder, see the needle go through, not feel the needle go through because there's no feeling in microsurgery. I'm taking microsurgery as an example. And there was no clear guidance on how to develop this mental script. So that was the basis of my conceptual framework to create this new model. So in the top, you see the learning theories that I've just mentioned through and the attributes are there. From these learning theories, what is needed is the creation of a mental script, which then allows for the development of an instructional media, which is the video. And then you have this instructional module, which you then use as an intervention uh, to validate this learning program for surgical skill acquisition. To design and develop instructional material, you require the science of learning, which is instructional design and technology. So these are the various models, the ID model, the design and development techniques, and the Mayer's co uh, cognitive theory of multimedia learning. So we all learn by multimedia, sound, sight, touch, and, and the like, basically the two, uh, the audios and the visual. So coming to surgical training, what we need in a complex surgical procedure to create an expert, we require the person to observe the procedure of a master surgeon. So you need a master surgeon to perform, to demonstrate, and allow the uh, trainee to experience that motor task to produce that. From then on, we teach them the mental skills to have motor imagery. Imagine the motor action required to perform that particular task. And then to practice this covertly in his head based on the memory that he had with during the demonstration or the practice session. From that mental practice, as he now gets the uh, repeated action, he then goes on to deliberate practice. Now, deliberate practice is to practice it on covert overtly on a practice model. And then he takes that to the real world in the operating theater, gets it assessed and becomes a master surgeon. This is one of the tools that we develop in my research. And this is how to execute this theoretical model that this new model. So we identify the motor task. And in this, in my research, we use uh, micro suturing in the rubber glove model. It's a cheap, uh, high fidelity, low cost model. What we did was we had five expert surgeons who are microsurgeons with an average age of 52.6 years old in Singapore. And we did a cognitive walkthrough. We told them to describe how to perform micro suturing in a rubber glove with all the kinesthetic cues of how they would hold the needle. And we took the narrative from each of the surgeon, um, uh, research assistant and myself, we then did a transcription of the, uh, we, we, we did, audit, did a video audio tape, and then we did a thematic analysis 
of the various things that each one said, we summarized it and perform a hierarchical uh, task analysis to then develop a mental script based. We took that mental script after collecting, went back to the five experts for validation and consensus development. After two rounds, we had saturation and there was consensus. Then we took this mental script and using the multimedia theory of Mayer, created an instructional module, right, with 13 different chapters, and we deployed it onto a learning management system as a validated learning module on microsurgery. And then we introduced the motor task to the participants in the uh, final phase of our study. We used 20, uh, we did 22 medical students, but in the end we had only 20 because one from each arm dropped out. We introduced the motor task and in the control group, they just watch a normal video on how to perform micro suturing with a script, uh, with the normal instructional material. And they did five days of microsurgical uh, practice and then they were assessed. The experimental group had one hour of mental skill training by me and they practiced twice a day uh, motor imagery and then came back to do the task of deliberate practice and then assess. So that's that's how you deliver. This is the tool on how to deliver this new model of surgical training uh, using deliberate practice. Sorry. Uh, so here is the results of the hierarchical task analysis, uh, uh, analysis for micro suturing. I, I won't go into the details. Uh, this will be available for you uh, on, on my website. You can look at it. It just basically how to align the edges, how to drive the needle, how to withdraw our switches. And so we did a, a detailed analysis of the task and subtask that were involved uh, from beginning to the end. So it's very highly uh, uh, um, granular uh, uh, process. And this is the mental script and this is just a blow up. Uh, it's two pages long. The, the, the cues in red are actually for kinesthetic cues. It describes how you feel, uh, how, what, you, what to watch for, and just not the step of suturing. So it's quite detailed in process, and this is the uh, mental script. So this is the final module that is available. Uh, there's a URL there, you can go and see, and the various chapters are there, the 13 lessons uh, that goes through from needle holding to suturing. And just to quickly uh, run through that, I have another five minutes. So this is, we, we, we had uh, good face and content validity for the mental script that we developed from the expert panel. Uh, the script validation was done with 20 participants, both 10 novices and 10 experienced surgeons using a questionnaire called a Moto Imagery Questionnaire to see how confident they were of performing the task after listening to the mental script. And we had a very good Cromback Alpha indicating that it had internal consistency. And we also used, uh, th this is the, the uh, MIQ, the Mental Imagery Questionnaire. These are questions that you ask uh, after you develop the question. And this, we use a storyboard to create the ex expert instructional video. We used the mental script, we converted it to an audio file that became the narration. And then we had a master surgeon perform the micro suturing. And then we broke it up into chunks in micro learning uh, bits to create the learning module. This is the experiment, the, the, the pilot that we did through experimental model. Uh, those are the things. When we looked at the time taken to perform the task, we had, they had five sutures to perform in a rubber glove model. There was, though the experimental group was slightly faster, but it's not statistically significant. However, when you look at the quality of the sutures, and you can see that in the left and the right, these are people who have never done any microsurgery after five hours using the technique there was a very strong statistical significance in the quality in the experimental group. Uh, we used the SMART score, which is the Stanford uh, uh, Microsurgery uh, Resident Assessment Tool, and uh, it was significant. So with that, I end there and I'll leave time for questions. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wai. Uh, amazing, amazing. You know, uh, how many things you have told, I don't know. Uh, if we need to repeat the video to see how we, you know, you need to get all those uh, very, very important and pertinent facts you have told, right from the fact that uh, what is a deliberate practice? 
you know, structural uh, and motor skills. And then to have a four models, cognitive, observational, uh, regular reinforcement, and then uh, cognitive regression. So all those are very, very you know, important aspect of how the training is to be given. And the way you have stressed about the mental training, you know, mental training and mental get, getting up to the, uh, holding a microscope and feeling a microscope, something is different. Uh, it was incredible. And beyond that, the way you explained about the competency and the expert, the competency and becoming an expert, and how do you finally become an expert after following all these deliberate practice? Um, thank you once again for a wonderful talk. Uh, we will have definitely a lot of questions at the end. Uh, next, I uh, uh, invite Dr. V. Lam. Uh, thanks for joining us, uh, Dr. V. It's a great privilege and honor to have you here. Uh, he is the uh, editor for the Journal of Hand Surgery, European. Um, he is the past president of uh, Be First, British Foundation of International Reconstructive Surgery and Training, an official arm of the PRAS. Uh, he has been awarded the BSSH uh, Strict Traveling Fellowship and Palutop Prize for his, you know, um, uh, intriguing work. Uh, his passion is about research, training, and teaching. Uh, we have all three eminent and uh, one more apt moderator for this special topic. Uh, Dr. V, thanks again, and uh, let us hear from your talk. Thank you. Uh, how can I share screen? Uh, I will make you. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, can you see the video? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jerome. So, um, I, I, I'm learning a lot this afternoon. Uh, I'm going to slightly different uh, text and provide more of an overview uh, of uh, my experience uh, in teaching and training, especially from my experience from from B first. So I hope this video plays and you can hear the sound. Is this okay? Uh, your your volume. Vilam, you must use the audio of your application. Sorry, can you hear me? We can, can hear, hear not the not the uh, audio from the video. You cannot hear the audio from the video. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. you have to tick the box "Share Audio from Application." Tick the box "Share Audio from Where." From from the application. So when you share the videos, you will see a. Uh, Thing to include the voice, the, the audio from that application. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna try again. Yeah. Uh, share, take the audio. Uh, your your video. Uh, it just allows me to share. It doesn't doesn't say anything more than that. Audio connection. You, you you can't hear no no we only hear you um you have to switch uh, the audio i think you know when you click on the mic switch the audio to on the on the microphone you click i think there's something called switch audio on the microphone I think so. I'm not very sure because in Zoom, we just click use audio from the application, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Can you just speak, uh, Vila? Yes, I'm trying to get the, the PowerPoint up actually. Yeah. Hold on a minute.
Okay, you see the screen? Perfect. Okay, I think I'll just uh, give it live. It's okay. I think yeah. uh, you can hear me, yeah? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so uh, yeah, I, I, I think um, there, there's actually several uh, webinars going on this weekend, and I think those who have joined us are the ones who are who have a passion for, for teaching. Um, so uh, I want to follow on from uh, Vaikuntan's talk, especially with further thoughts about microsurgery uh, simulation, uh, and then I'll move on to a wider overview about, about curriculum design, and then uh, bring in the context of overseas education and uh, virtual webinars uh, and the world we live in now. Uh, it's a very different world, as you can see. So first of all, the uh, the micro uh, overview. Uh, I want to share about the simulation model that we have chosen. Um, this is uh, what uh, Vi has already shared: the Fitz and Posner uh, model describing three phases in the acquisition of motor skills: the cognitive phase, where we have to think about every step; the associative phase, where we develop muscle memory; and then the autonomous uh, phase, where uh, People usually say where there's no need to think anymore. So it's, oh, sorry, it's a sorry, lot like... Oh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Yes? Yeah. Can you switch on your video? Your video, your face video. Oh, okay. Yeah, sorry. Uh... Okay. Yeah, perfect. Please go ahead. Thank you. Okay, right. So we have... Uh... I mean, this is a lot like driving a car. This, this is the way I look at it. It is quite hard at first. Uh, we grab, grip the wheel with both hands. Uh, we're so careful and then we can drive without thinking. It becomes all in the cerebellum, uh, whether this is for tendon repair or microsurgery. So, so people often say you don't have to think of anymore, but I, I, I think actually you still have to think. Of course, you still have to think when doing surgery. But in my opinion, when you reach the autonomous stage is when you probably no longer feel any stress before the procedure. You don't, you don't, you don't think about it that much anymore. Your, your movements are a lot more fluid. So, um, simulation provides an excellent environment for the facilitation of reaching this autonomous stage, especially in the um, technical aspect. Resnick and McRae, once, once the skill is achieved, then the trainee can focus on more complex issues, both technical and non-technical in the operating room. And that is important. So if trainees have mastered the basic surgical skills, it allows them to uh, uh, then concentrate on some other important things. So in this very insightful article, Nibon and Nesto, they described uh, the, the framework in which uh, simulation training should, uh, should take place. The operating theater is a complex environment where the surgeon not only have to perform highly complex uh, procedures, but also exercises teamwork, communication, and complex decision-making skills. So the, the, the authors argue for a, a shift from simulation training to simulated situations. So simulation on its own is not, is not everything. Another article by Nibon, um, he, he again, uh, describe the, the, the context uh, and the objective of simulation. It should allow for sustained, deliberate practice within a safe environment. It should provide access to expert tutors and should map onto real life clinical experience. I think both speakers uh, before me have already spoken about this. According to this definition by Nibon, there are three essential components. First of all, there should be the right simulation resource. And I think this includes uh, both the equipment and the time. The General Medical Council in the UK stressed the importance of doctors in training, having protected time for learning while they are doing clinical or medical work. So in the context of simulation, uh, I, I think this means that trainees must not be interrupted while they are performing simulation training unless there is an uh, emergency. The second uh, component, in my opinion, often overlooked. I think this has been mentioned again, vitally important. The trainees should have access to expert tutors. It is no use just to provide the simulation resource for the trainee. We have to be there to teach them. The, the, the simulation training should be seen as, as important as teaching in the operating theater. And the third, uh, it should map onto real life clinical experience. And I think this comes down to how we package the whole thing. 
So deciding on the simulation, getting the right balance, uh, again, I'm going to use the example of microsurgery. Success of microsurgery ultimately depends on whether you can join two vessels together. And so most of the simulation tools have focused on that. So if you look at the literature, uh, there has been an explosion of tools, uh, each focusing on a particular aspect, uh, the use of uh, cadaveric animals, uh, multimedia demonstrations, virtual reality, reality training, hand and instrument motion analysis. And so most of this focus on dexterity, economy of motion, but that there still remains an el element of subjectivity uh, in the final outcome assessment. So in our own um, search for a more objective simulation tool, we decided after, after years of looking around to experiment with the digital micro trainer system. And this, this consists of a, a set of clamps, uh, uh, which, uh, mount, uh, which is mounted on a multi-joint arm, positions a latex uh, strip, and then the trainee will practice micro surgery. This is, this is a setup in our, in our lab. Uh, so the, the tabletop microscope and then a, cam a camera for the expert to look at you. And then the um, suture strip is then photographed using a digital microscope. The image is transferred to a custom software and it gives a final score. So the score is either good or bad. So you, can, you can't lie. So, so we can get consultants to suture and, and, and the consultants have a score. Uh, they may not necessarily be better than the score from a trainee. So following knee bones definition, we, we designed a one day introduction to microsurgery course that focused on the three components of simulation. So our course philosophy uh, is to use the right resource, a good tutor to student ratio, and then map onto a, a real world experience uh, using animal models. So this final bit, the ability to adapt is actually very important. So the, the student have a feel of what it feels like in real life. So this is the course outline. Uh, we start off with the introduction. And then we let them uh, try the micro trainer and then we move on to the chicken artery, chicken vein, and then we finish off with another micro trainer assessment. Now, many of these candidates uh, have never done any microsurgery, like, like Vicontin's uh, 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 participants. Many of them are my, uh, students. So we measure the scores at the beginning and then we measure the scores at the end and then we can see progress and the winner gets a prize. So this is the kind of scores we can get from the candidates from a typical course. You can actually see the improvement of the course over one day. So you can imagine if you then put in deliberate practice, how much uh, better you will get. This is just in the course of one day. Now you may wonder about this one horizontal uh, score. This is actually a research fellow with experience in microsurgery. So he spends all his time suturing vessels in rest. So he's really very, very good. So uh, he can't really get any much better. So this is the Edinburgh course uh, and such a model, I think is very reproducible. And so far we have uh, conducted this course uh, in, in Myanmar and, uh, and, and hope to do so in other places. And we use exactly the same model. Now our courses have been put back because of the pandemic in, in the college uh, in Edinburgh. We currently are looking at how we can run this online. This is the BSSH uh, online tendon course. And I think it's likely we will need to look at more online simulation calls in the future and how we can deliver this and invest in this. And, and this is not going to be easy, but it's, 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 it's a very exciting development. Now, I want to switch direction now to focus on the macro overview. I want to continue to use microsurgery as, a, as an example and talk a little bit about our experience with designing a microsurgery curriculum. So although vascular patency is key, it is not everything. Microsurgery is much more than just the joining of two vessels. So the trainee needs to not just join the two vessels, the trainee also needs to develop competency in decision making. And that, in my opinion, means choosing the right vessels, the right flap, designing the, the, the flap correctly, handling the failures, and also be able to innovate. Now, this, is, uh, this pie chart is following my experience in, in Changgeng uh, Fellowship. I, I call this a pie chart of energy. I have this mentally in my mind when I'm doing a free flap. I divide my energy expenditure into five parts. So first of all, I will uh, reserve some energy for flap harvest and then for flap inset and then for recipient preparation and then the anastomosis. But I, I always remind myself to keep one fifth of my energy for take backs in case I have to. The, the operation is not over once the patient leaves the OR. So the other consideration as mentioned is that the, the, the microsurgery is a relatively young specialty. So an ideal curriculum should include parameters, not only for established techniques, but also to inspire the trainee to innovate. 
So this was our attempt to design such a curriculum. We focus on the macro overview, decision making. Uh, there is already so much out there uh, when, when we published this. Our approach was to define certain parameters and to, and to divide them into basic, intermediate and advanced skills. And then instead of just telling them like a normative assessment, just tell on them normative uh, curriculum, uh, uh, telling them what we think, we actually asked different uh, fellows and residents what they think about this. We surveyed 12 international fellows and then 27 registrars in, in Scotland. Um, and this was, this was the uh, skill sets that we set. What we chose, uh, we, we chose what we thought were basic, intermediate or advanced skill sets. So for example, we, we thought vessel prep, muscle flap, perforator flap, donor flap, uh, flap selection should be pretty basic skills. Anatomical variations, take backs, uh, when you can't find your usual recipient vessels, complex defects, chimery flaps, chimeric flaps should be intermediate. And then finally, uh, functional reconstruction, uh, free joint transfer, for example, new flaps should be advanced. At that time, lymphatic surgery has just started. So we thought this should be a new application of microsurgery. Everybody was going into it. And this was our result. It's fascinating. And this is what we thought, and this was our, our result. So immediately you can see how the darker shades. So, so basically the darker it is, the more complex it is. You can see how the darker shades immediately move to the left. That means a lot of trainees and fellows think that uh, things are more complicated than we thought they are. So a lot of trainees and fellows think that take back of a flap is a very advanced skill. And also what do you do when you cannot find your recipient vessels? So, so vessel preparation is the only truly basic skill. Although we know that's not always easy, try, try doing that in the uh, two week old open tibia fracture, it's not easy. So from the survey, three out of 12 uh, receive a structured clinical curriculum before the start of their fellowship. And that's quite surprising, but all of them felt that a curriculum would be helpful. And, and this kind of curriculum is generic enough, whatever subspecialty you pursue. We then looked at the time it would take to achieve the necessary skill sets. The fellows felt that six months is generally sufficient to acquire basic skill sets. While a, a fellow does spends all his time doing microsurgery, the, 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 the registrar in the UK felt that a lot more time was needed. So this study highlighted the importance of having a structured curriculum. More importantly, what we are doing about ensuring they have the necessary competencies. Uh, Vaikuntin has mentioned that. Not, not every fellow should finish a one year fellowship becoming a super microsurgeon or coming up with an innovative technique, although we must encourage innovation and we definitely must encourage deliberate practice to, to ensure they fulfill the core competencies. Uh, a very interesting article from Sears et al. Uh, they surveyed the training program director in essential areas of practice and, and uh, knowledge topics in hand surgery. The TPDs in America, mainly orthopedics, uh, concluded that uh, the wrist, the distal radius and the ulna, forearm and peripheral nerve conditions were rated as essential areas of practice. Uh, burns is not really rated as an essential area. That's, that's quite interesting. 48%, less than half, rated microsurgery as essential. And most thought that a one-year fellowship was enough to train a competent hand surgeon. Now, having defined what was essential, they then published this article, 2013, gaps in exposure uh, and of the topics that were essential, uh, they found that congenital hands and vascular conditions had the most exposure gaps. That means a lot of fellows did not have enough exposure to this. And the conclusion was that the field of hand surgery must work to determine if program directors have unrealistic expectations for what is essential practice, uh, practicing hand surgeon or if reforms are needed to improve exposure. In other words, redefine your program or, ch uh, or change your program. My, my own experience in teaching congenital hand surgery in the UK, often I find there's a very small number of trainees uh, with genuine interest. The majority have a motivation of what I need to know for exams. Some conditions are very rare. That's, uh, that means it's very difficult to get exposure. So I need to think about solutions. Do I need to use video teaching to be deliberate? Uh, do I even need to encourage deliberate practice for them to be competent in congenital hand surgery? Uh, uh, probably not. Uh, these are the things I need to think about. Uh, but teaching for exams remains a real challenge. So let me end by uh, talking a little bit about overseas education and the world we live in now. I want to join my experience from, from uh, B first. 
So you may be familiar with the Lancet Commission. Five billion has problems with surgical access. And I think hand surgery is way down in that priority. So we think that if we think that countries like the UK or USA are, uh, have challenges, uh, just imagine what they are for uh, certain developing countries. So in, in B first, we have been uh, trying to come up with a holistic strategy to teach hand surgery in developing countries. This is our uh, four prong uh, strategy uh, and, and um, how, how things have changed in, in the old way of doing things pre pandemic. We will visit a place and the visits are supplemented by online learning. Now, the current way of doing things during the pandemic, online learning is everything. And, and we, we really want the future way of doing things, not just to go back to the way things were, but to really have physical visits and online learning to have equal importance. So we have to think about uh, uh, really how can we do online uh, teaching better? And there are advantages and disadvantages of online versus uh, physical conference. Uh, I wouldn't go too much into this. Let me share some of my thoughts. So it's not easy uh, and uh, we all know this, those of us who organize this kind of conference. So this is the, um, the strategy that we have been using and uh, I credit Vaikuntan as well for helping me to think about this. In order to, to, to teach, we have to first of all define the curriculum. What are the learning needs? We have to design the curriculum uh, and to have a macro picture and then the micro picture uh, which probably this is where probably where deliberate practice comes in, and then we need to have an idea for uh, support and evaluation. So defining the curriculum, uh, we need to find out what the learning needs are. What should we be teaching? And this comes from years of reflection and survey of the learning needs. Designing the curriculum, the macro overview is important to have. Uh, both a horizontal integration and vertical integration. So horizontal integration is how the, the different uh, topics overlap. Vertical integration is how each module builds on the basic science into clinical application, a process called contextualization. So this you learn this through case-based discussion. This is how we learn medicine, and this should be how we teach medicine and not jump straight into surgery uh, uh, because technical skills isn't everything. So the foundation is important. So uh, this is uh, just to highlight what horizontal integration means. Very seldom do you get an injury in isolation. Uh, they, they occur as composite defects. And, and vertical uh, uh, integration, for example, a tendon module should start off with the basic signs and then go into surgery, walans, these uh, examples, for example, of mango can, so on and so forth. And then finally, the importance of a spiral curriculum. A spiral curri curriculum means to revisit material in increasing levels of complexity, how uh, we have to keep revisiting the different uh, uh, modules and help the, the trainee develop higher order thinking. What is higher order thinking? I think this is one of my favorite models that I keep uh, referring to uh, when I'm teaching. Uh, we, we start off uh, with uh, learning by, uh, first of all, missing the point. This is how people learn. Uh, then after that, they finally get the point, but they see it as a very simple single point to solve simple problems. Then they are able to uh, develop list and algorithm, uh, but it is still in, in, a, in a very artificial manner. Then they are able to see how the list connects together and give a logical uh, explanation uh, or logical strategy for solving complex problems. And then finally, they are able to bring everything together. So this is when higher order thinking has been developed. The initial phase is quantitative and then it becomes qualitative. So when we are uh, organizing online webinars for teaching, I think we need to take time to think about whether there is horizontal integration, vertical integration, and whether we are really achieving the teaching of higher order thinking in our webinars. So in conclusion, hand surgery teaching must be deliberate, intentional, uh, constantly evaluated, whether this is online, in person, in a developing country or developed country. Our curriculum must be needs driven. Uh, if our curriculum is not ideal, we need to either redefine it or find other ways to teach it. Uh, I think hand surgery teaching is very exciting. Uh, lots of room for improvement. I want to applaud. Uh, Terence uh, and the organizers for hosting this webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uli. Uh, we are uh, fascinating, fascinating. You know, uh, how many things you have told. Uh, it's amazing. You know, it's interesting that the module you suggested 
about the high thinking uh, one uh, reflects the you know order of you know curriculum changes which we need uh, defining designing and delivering uh, of course is the order of the day every surgeons or the budding surgeons uh, need to have this curriculum uh, moreover the article about japras and the uh, journal of reconstruction surgery is a must read for all uh, you know, t- tutors or teachers uh, to train to train the surgeons uh, it's a wonderful wonderful amazing talk uh, thanks for uh, you know, a wonderful outlook and overview of the current practices for training health uh, we have a special invitee uh, professor dr steve here for the discussion part uh with uh, he is the director for of the uh, srm institute in chennai in tamil nadu in india He's a great teacher and a mentor for many of the younger surgeons here in india uh with a short introduction uh, we will hear from dr steve uh, about this uh, experience and the view of how to train uh, young health surgeons in the generations thank you doctor uh, thank you Now, I think I will just wind up what Philip Wycombe and we said. I think putting together, it looked to me like the part one, part two, part three. The entire three talks looked to me like one talked on the basic fundamentals of deliberate practice, the mentoring and experience has defined it so well. And then Wycombe went into the acquiring the motor skill, the observation and the deliberate practice and more importantly the cognitive vigor i think the mental script something which is really wonderful which i thought that's what we possibly involuntarily do when we go for a case that the mental script in your mind rather than in the video what he makes even when we operate i think we have a mental script of what we are going to do i think nothing is better than ortlens manual for microsurgery which really tells you how to get out of each and every single problem like the sliding of the knot and also how you are holding it longer what would be the mistake i think that's an excellent one and then finally when i listen to me it looked to me that he has really told about the clinical situation how what are the gaps in war and the higher order of thinking which he said from the basic to the final i think if you put all these three together i think you have made a curriculum for ourselves i think that has been an excellent one now when you look at training in hand surgery i basically put it in three different perspective the number one is the theoretical part of it but it is practical again like you look at a hand you have to have a mental picture or whether i have to release the thumb bit first or whether i have to do the metacarpophalangeal joint contracture whether i have to do the capsulotomy or whether i have to do an extensor tendon tenolysis all these three will be there in a particular given situation which one comes first then comes how do i do the tenolysis then how do i do the capsulotomy how i release the thumb bit i think this analytical aspect of clinical material is first is the one which is required which is how we start training our hand surgeons first only to analyze and not about the skill set but the practical topic which you have given about the deliberate practice is something on skill development more now we have to realize the first half is the planning which can be done only by mentoring i have seen many people hand surgeons do the first thing last and then get into your problem for example if i say for example you have a flexor contracture or your burn case where there is a pip contracture and then also there is an extensor capsular contracture of the metacarpophalangeal joint if you start releasing the metacarpophalangeal joint then you will realize that the movement of the hand will not be good unless unless you release the flexor first and then do the empty joint that we have seen this many times doing the topsy turvy i think that is the first thing then the second one is the practice of the skill sets 
In skill sets, as far as India is concerned, I think we concentrate on mainly three things. Number one, we concentrate necessarily on microvascular skill sets. I think now various courses are being run wherein we have microvascular skill sets. So that skill set is the next one which is important. And the second one is the bone fixation sets. And then I personally feel we have to reintroduce at least four weeks of anatomy dissection back again. After the because we looked at anatomy when we did the first MBBS entirely in a different perspective. Now, when you look at the anatomy, I feel that entirely we look at it in a different way. The simplest thing what I would like to see, I have seen the junior surgeons when there is an extension of policy longer, which is divided, going into the forearm, searching for the retracted proximal end. You will find invariably they will be going somewhere towards the radial side of the forearm and not in the middle. You would have realized the proximal end would have crossed the ECR, ECR and it is the third compartment retracted well, which they will never realize that and they will be digging on the radial side more. Now, this I think if they go back to their anatomy and realize that, that will be good. The same way you will see about the radius on the dorsal aspect, the vascular anatomy on the radius. I think that will help you if you go back again to one month of anatomy. And as far as India is concerned, you have plastic surgeons practicing hand, you have an orthopedic surgeon practicing hand, and you will realize many orthopedic hand surgeons may not do your flap, microvascular free flap, and most of the hand surgeons will not do the lower end of the radius or the carpus, or you are going to do the now we have to create hand surgeon, not plastic surgeon or orthopedic surgeon. So for that, we need a more structured course. So now first is analyze, next is acquire the skill, and third is apply the skill onto the clinical practice. I think that requires only mentoring. Without mentoring, applying that is not going to happen. So all these three have to be done. And we have a system in, when I'm trained, Somewhere in 1978, I got trained way back about 40 years back. At that time, after emergency of the previous day, next day morning, we have to present all the major cases to everyone. Now, that is the feedback we are going to get. We will show the pre-op x-ray, the post-op x-ray, and also the x-ray with the POP on. When you see that x-ray with the plaster pad is on, you will realize how much of the extension it is there in MP joint and the MP joint is not kept actually flexed properly when you are given a bulky dressing. I would suggest this as a feedback. Many times you yourself can see after putting the plaster paris or any other splint, taking an X-ray, we will realize that the amount of flexion which is given to the medical phalangeal joint is not good enough. So the feedback is something which is really required. I feel we have a need-based curriculum has to be taught. Many units do not do paralyzed hand. Many units do not do burnt hand. I don't know how many do cerebral palsies, how many do tendon transfers for paralysis. So these are the areas which I feel an exchange is required. If you are qualified in orthopedics, Six months at least, they must work in plastic surgery unit. And the vice versa is true. If you are a plastic surgeon, at least six months, he must work in orthopedic. I think to wind up, what is required is a sustained, deliberate practice, both on the model and on the clinical, also is required. The models nowadays, we are doing a lot of 3D printed models for fixations, especially. And we are using pig legs wherein those models can be used for all the things, like for example, tender, nerve repair, flat transposition, Z plus this, all can be practiced, thumb release on a big leg model. I think that is one which is comparatively simpler. We can give all of our hand surgery training models like that. And then now the virtual simulation has also come into picture in India. I think we started doing that. To wrap up, I think decision in planning, then skill development, separate engineering, 
and then application of the skill on the clinical practice requires mentoring. I think we can open to questions which have been come from the students. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Sridhar. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, you know, words of wisdom about the need-based training, and then uh, you mentioned about the anatomy which we read in uh, uh, during your graduation is completely, you know, what we don't see in a postgraduate or a training or an expert. It's completely, you don't have that, you know, exposure of anatomy. So anatomy learning is must, as you rightly mentioned, and the different sets of you know, pattern, nerve, tendon, uh, the flaps. So all these things, they need a mentor uh, to, to train their uh, younger surgeons. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Um, we have a few questions which were uh, answered by Dr. Y and Dr. Uh, uh, um, we We will have a short uh, uh, closing remarks by all these uh, uh, three speakers and the moderators. Quick 30 seconds comment, and then probably we'll uh, end up, wind up this session. Uh, we'll start with Dr. Kalipi. Your uh, quick 30 seconds closing remark. Uh, thank you uh, again very much, sir, for your kind invitation. And I was, uh, you know, uh, struck by the, the two very good presentation of my colleagues, uh, really amazing. And I think we should uh, set up an international uh, society focused on this great practice. And you, sir, should be the, the one who uh, gathered all of us. You are the younger and, uh, you know, the more powerful. And, uh, and I, you know, I, I think you are, it, it's important to do this. I, I would only uh, say something about the deliberate practice. Deliberate practice is an amazing technique, an amazing method to increase the skills and the performance of young and senior surgeons too. But as a university professor, I have to confess that I can't um, apply deliberate practice on all of my uh, 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 students, residents, fellow, in all of their uh, activities. It's impossible, you know, uh, they're only 24 hours a day. So, you know, I realized with this technique that what is important is to, uh, to, to, to make the young surgeons appropriate this, uh, the, the, the method of delivery practice, and also the mental uh, uh, script, you know, the, the mental preparation of the, the operation. They don't realize that it is possible to do this. You know what? Uh, uh, we have two operating rooms dedicated to hand surgery in my department. Sometimes I operate in one, and there is a young fellow in another one. And sometimes he's just calling me uh, because he's got some difficulty, and uh, I just uh, uh, go to the other room. I watch uh, 30 seconds uh, what's going on, I give him advice, and then I go back to my, uh, to my room. Actually, I don't know what he's doing exactly. I can't watch all the all the surgery of my young colleagues. So I just say, oh, it's bad, it's good, or it's good, and that's all. It's not enough. So what we do in my department, every week, every one hour, we are we have, uh, 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 we have many staff meetings, but one is dedicated to deliberate practice. We record all the surgery, all the videos of all the surgeries in my department. And sometimes we pick up, every week we pick up one, two, three videos of a senior a surgeon, of a young surgeon, and then we watch all together, we call the, 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 the staff meeting and we discuss and we say, okay, this gesture is not good because of this, that one is good because of that, and so on. And all the young surgeons are very, very happy to uh, to, to watch the and to interact uh, with the senior surgeon. So I think it's, uh, of course, it's, uh, it, it's very important to go to David practice, but it's impossible to do it, you know, on all operations, on all young surgeons. So we have to make them understand that they have to appropriate themselves this new method of teaching surgery. Thank you for uh, listening to me. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, Dr. Felipe. Well, well said, well said, and uh, you made a point about it. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Y, 
I, I think deliberate practice is in the current environment is the way the strategy to increase the training level of our surgeons. I think they need to move from trainers of surgery to take back control of surgical training. A surgeon who does not know how to operate in a high level cannot be a surgeon because of the high stake involved in surgery. I think that's one recognition that needs to say. Uh, the role of uh, non-technical skills are important, but they do not make a surgeon. Number two, with the shortened time for surgical uh, practice and in certain areas where you do not have high volume practice, the role of mental practice with deliberate practice is the way to maintain and acquire skill set to an expert level. I think we should move away from just competency, which is the ground, and move towards excellence, which is the ceiling. And excellence has to be described. And leaders in, in surgical field need to retake the role of surgery uh, for training, because I think a lot of surgeons, uh, are good surgeons, don't give enough time to write and research in surgical training based on the language of educational psychology and the language of teaching and learning. So uh, with that, I will, that's my comment. Thanks. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Wai. Um, definitely, we, we need to have a you know, cur curriculum to change from the competency to expert level. Thank you. Um, Dr. V, your closing remarks. So, uh... I haven't really got much else to, to add. I think um, for deliberate practice to take place, we must have deliberate teaching and deliberate mentoring. And I think herein really lies the challenge uh, because of the time pressure, because of the pressure upon uh, uh, work. Uh, it, it may be difficult sometimes to find trainers who are dedicated to provide that kind of mentoring provide that kind of environment where deliberate practice can take place. I also want to add that deliberate uh, practice uh, in, addition, uh, in addition to technical skills should also be in the, the thinking process. As I said earlier in my talk, in the higher order thinking, I want to come back as a, to that example that uh, Professor Sridhar used again in what order do you release the MCP joint? I find that a fascinating example and it all comes down to anatomy. It all comes down to what the foundation is, uh, and therefore, what I said earlier, it, you know, the importance of building a foundation from basic science, uh, and then to contextualization, and then to finally uh, doing the surgery. I, th I think that remains a weakness in our in our teaching program. We have to come back to basics again, and and that can be nothing more basic than anatomy. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Doctor Wee. Thank you, Doctor Wee. Uh, to see that you're closing the map. To see that you're closing the map. It's an excellent one. I think the session has no. I think all of us have learned a lot from each other. I think that is the best way of mentoring. I think listening to these talks that's, is a good. I think they have mentored me also in my teaching. I think it's a good way uh, to learn. I think it's excellent. I think the mental one, I think the training is what is required. I think all of them have emphasized on this. That's a very great thing. That is the mental script. I think that is the right thing. I think that's a lovely word which I have learned today. I think that's a good one. And what uh, we said about that, I think we've got to go in a methodical way of higher order of thinking. I think that's the, these two, I think I will take it as a take home method for me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Steeler. So overall, overall, we come to an end. Uh, with a lot of, lot of things we have learned. Uh, Dr. Felipe, he said about the experience and the experience and the expert. Dr. Y, more specified about uh, competency to expert uh, along with the mental script. Dr. B spoke about the simulation and uh, the, the practice of the surgeons. And Dr. Sridhar overall uh, made a cumulative effort of getting all those uh, facts and notably basic anatomic going back. Thank you one and all for joining us. We had a great time. Uh, God bless you.
wishing you all safe and healthy thank you once again thank you bye bye thank you